This algebraic geometry lecture will cover three examples of quotients of algebraic sets. So the first example is a cyclic quotient singularity. This is one of the simplest um, examples of a singularity formed by taking a quotient of something by a group. So we're going to take a fine affine in A squared, whose coordinate ring is a polynomial ring in two variables. And we're going to let the group G be a specific group of order N, which will be generated by some sigma of order N. That's a sigma of six. And it's going to act as follows. So sigma of X is going to be zeta of X, and sigma of y will be zeta of y, where zeta is just an nth root of unity. So zeta to the n equals one. Um, we're going to take it to be a primitive nth root of unity. For example, over the complex numbers, we might take zeta equals e to the two pi i over n. Um, now, um, we want to find out what is the quotient of the affine plane by this group, except we don't mean the quotient in the sense of topological spaces, we mean the quotient in the sense of algebraic geometry. And to do that, we have to look at the coordinate ring and look at the invariance of the coordinate ring under G. So now we have to find out what are the invariants. Well, it's quite easy to work out the action of G on all the monomials because sigma of X to the A, Y to the J is just equal to zeta to the I plus J, X to the I, Y to the J. And this is equal to X to the I, Y to the J if um, and only if I plus J is divisible by n. So this makes it pretty obvious that the ring of invariance has a basis um, consisting of the elements x to the i, y to the j, satisfying this condition here. So in order to see what's going on, it's Quite a good idea just to draw a picture. So let's draw all the monomials. We've got one x, x squared, x cubed, x to the four, and so on. Y, x, y, x squared, y, x cubed, y, y squared, y cubed, x, y squared, and so on. And now let's take n equals three, just so that I can do everything explicitly. And we see that the invariance consists of this element here and all the things on this third diagonal. And if we go a bit further, x to the five, x to the six, and here we have x to the five, y. And we'll to get all the things on this diagonal and so on. So every three steps, we, we get all the things on that diagonal. So we can now see that the um, ring of invariance is generated by all the things on this diagonal. So it's generated by x cubed, x squared y, x y squared, and y cubed. However, obviously these are not independent. So the um, if, if we call these elements c0, z1, z2, and z3, then the ring of invariance will be generated by Z0, Z1, Z2, and Z3. But obviously these are not independent, so we have to quotient out some relations between them. So what relations do you get? Well, you can see that Zi, Zj is equal to Zk, Zl, whenever I plus J equals K plus L. Um, so we should quotient out by um, well, what do we have? Well, we have Z1, Z2 minus C0, Z3, 
c1 squared minus c0, z2, z2 squared minus c1, z3. So we, we take this polynomial ring and we quotient out by this ideal. And this gives us the ring of invariants. So the quotient of the affine plane by the cyclic group is an is a is an affine variety whose coordinate ring is this ring here. So the next example is an example of a parameter space. So a parameter space is some sort of space whose points correspond to some configurations Um, a configuration isn't really a well-defined term. Roughly means it, it means some sort of, it might be, say, some sort of algebraic subset of some other variety. Um, for example, um, you might have a parameter space of lines inside space, or you might have a parameter space of conics in the plane and so on. Um, we are going to look at the parameter space of cyclohexane. So if you remember from chemistry, cyclohexane is a molecule with six carbon atoms and a few hydrogen atoms that I couldn't care less about that looks something like this. It's just six carbon atoms in a, in a, in a ring. And what we want to do is to ask for all the ways you can arrange these in three-dimensional space. So first of all, for each carbon atom, um, its center is specified by three numbers. So carbon atom, atom is just A3. So we've got six carbon atoms. So all together, we want six copies of three-dimensional space and we get 18-dimensional affine space. So, so this is the parameter space for six carbon atoms. However, there are some conditions these have to satisfy. So any two adjacent carbon atoms are at a fixed distance. Well, the condition for two carbon atoms to be at a fixed distance is a um, some sort of quadratic equation in these coordinates. So if the first carbon atom is x1, y1, z1, and the second is x2, y2, z2, then we have the condition x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared plus z1 minus z2 squared is some constant. So you see this is just some sort of quadratic equation. So we have six um, quadrics for the distances. Well, that's not all we get because we also have these fixed angles um, for each pair of bonds. Well, the, ang the, 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 the angle can be specified just by giving the distance between these two carbon atoms. So we also get another six quadrics for the angles. So altogether, we have 18-dimensional affine space, and then we write down 12 equations that the points have to satisfy. So we might guess that altogether, that's going to give us some parameter space of dimension 18 minus 6 minus 6. Hexane molecule, we can translate it without really changing it. And we can also rotate it. So what we should do is we should take the space of dimension, possibly 18 minus 6 minus 6, although really that's only a, um, a lower bound for the dimension, and quotient it out by the group of translations and rotations.
possibly reflections. And there are three translations or independent translations and the group of rotations is also three dimensional. So this is a six dimensional group. So the parameter space is given by taking this space here and quoting it out by this group here. Um, and we might, we might, for example, try and guess its dimension. So we can ask, what is the dimension? And there's an obvious guess, because here, this space looks as if it's going to be six dimensional, and we're quoting it out by a six dimensional group. So we might guess that the dimension of the quotient is going to be six minus six, which is zero. So we can ask, is it zero dimensional? The answer is no. Um, this was discovered by um, a guy called Hermann Saxer, who in 1890 discovered there were actually two different forms of cyclohexane. Um, so one form is called the chair form, and these look the same here. Um, so I better move them around a bit so you can see what the difference. So the chair form you can see these three carbon atoms here are in one plane and these three carbon atoms are in another. So these three carbon atoms here are sticking out of the plane. Um, in this boat form, these two carbon atoms are sticking out of the plane and these four carbon atoms are in the plane. So if I turn it round, you can see, if, if I arrange them like this, you, you, you can see the two forms are indeed different. So maybe, the parameter space has two points in it. Well, that turns out to be wrong too, because it turns out that this form of cyclohexane is flexible. You can sort of bend it round. So here I had these two carbon atoms sticking out of the plane. And if I just sort of manipulate now these two carbon atoms from the plane, so there's a one parameter space of positions it can be in. On the other hand, this form of the cyclohexane is rigid. Well, this particular one isn't rigid that's because these bonds are rather floppy. And if, if these bonds were rigid, then this would indeed be, be rigid. So the parameter space has, well, at least two components. It's got this point in it, and it's got a one-dimensional component that, that corresponds to this form of cyclohexane. So this just illustrates that you have to be a bit careful about guessing dimensions of quotients. The naive guess for dimension of quotient where you just subtract one for each equation you have and subtract one for each dimension of your group is a reasonable first guess for the dimension of a parameter space, but is sometimes just wrong. So the final example of today's lecture will be a moduli space. So a moduli space is a space whose points correspond to isomorphism classes of various things. And this sounds very much like a parameter space. And in fact, there's not really a whole lot of difference between a moduli space and a parameter space. They're both essentially the same thing. However, it's traditional to use parameter space if you're classifying things embedded in something else. For instance, if you're classifying lines in three space, you call it a parameter space. On the other hand, you use moduli space if you're classifying things that aren't really embedded in anything. Instance, classifying isomorphism classes of elliptic curves, you'd call that a moduli space, not a parameter space. If you were classifying elliptic curves embedded in four dimensional space, you'd probably call that a parameter space. So there's not, they're, they're more or less the same. And what we're going to do is to look very briefly at the moduli space of elliptic curves. Well, one of the problems with studying this is we haven't actually defined what an elliptic curve is. Um, 
so I'm just going to have to quote a few things about elliptic curves just to give you a rough idea of why moduli spaces can be quotients of things. So if we look at an, uh, an elliptic curve uh, over the complex numbers, it's a non-singular curve that's topologically isomorphic to a torus. So it looks something like this. We'll be discussing elliptic curves much more later. And we later see that any elliptic curve can be put into this form, y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c, um, which you can write as y squared equals x minus alpha, x minus beta, x minus gamma. Well, you can obviously make some changes of variables without really changing the isomorphism class of this elliptic curve. For instance, we can, we can translate x just by adding a constant to it and turn it into y squared equals x, x minus beta, x minus gamma. And then we can rescale x and y to turn one of these numbers into one. So we get y squared equals x, x minus one, x minus lambda. It's traditional to use lambda for this parameter. So this suggests that elliptic curves might be classified by numbers lambda. Uh, however, that's not quite true because if you change lambda to one over lambda, then you haven't really changed the curve. You've really only swapped these two variables. So this is invariant under changing lambda to um, um, one over lambda. It's also, if you change lambda to one minus lambda, then again, the isomorphism class of this curve doesn't change. And then you can compose these, so you can change it to one over one minus lambda, or lambda over lambda minus one, or lambda minus one over lambda. So there are six things you can do to lambda. Um, you can change it to itself or to one of these five things. And in fact, these six transformations form a group which is in fact isomorphic to the symmetric group of order three. You see if you compose any two of these transformations you get another one that's similar to it. And here I should have mentioned that lambda is not equal to naught or one. So what is happening is you're getting this affine variety which is given by a1 minus the point zero or one and you're quotienting it out by this group of order six. And this space here is more or less a moduli space of elliptic curves, except moduli spaces turn out to have rather large numbers of fussy technical details. So that's not quite correct, but never mind. Um, first of all, um, I said this is an affine variety. Well, it doesn't at first sight look like an affine variety because it's actually an open set of A1. Whereas I said affine varieties were supposed to be closed irreducible sets. Um, however, if lambda is a vector in here, you can think of A1 minus these two points as just the curve lambda times lambda minus one times mu equals naught in A2. So here we're taking lambda and mu to be coordinates in A2. And you can see this curve is really just isomorphic to A1 minus two points, so that doesn't matter. So what exactly is this space A1 minus two points modulo S3? Well, we take the coordinate ring of this space here, which is just K lambda one over lambda one over lambda minus one. So it's a subring of the ring of rational functions, and take its a subring that is invariant under the group S3 of order six. And um, in order to describe this, you want to find some polyno some rash some polynomial in these three things that is invariant under these transformations of S3. And the simplest one is traditionally called J and it's equal to two to the eight times lambda squared minus lambda plus one cubed, all divided by lambda squared, lambda minus one squared. So you can check if you do any of these six transformations to lambda, J remains fixed. 
And in fact, the ring of invariants turns out to be just isomorphic all polynomials in J. So this number J is actually the famous so-called J invariant of an elliptic curve that we will be studying a bit more later on. Um, incidentally, this funny factor of two to the eight is made so that things work nicely in characteristic two. 